Sword, Chap 10. Now Chap 11. CTD. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. Kostoglatov answered Rusonov and answered Amajan. But, okay, so I've already read that part. Oh, yeah, the reply to his own letters. It was not a deeply thought-out decision. It was all done through a movement of his scarred chin from Rusonov to Amajan, past the man without a voice. But does he say how to use it? asked the geologist. He had pencil and paper in front of him. He always had when he was reading a book. How to use it? All right, get your pencils and I'll dictate, said Kostogotov. Everyone rushed about, asking each other for pencil and paper. Pavel Nikolaevich didn't have anything. He'd left his fountain pen at home, the one with the enclosed nib, the new kind. Dayomka gave him a pencil. Sibgatov, Federow, Yefrem, and Ni all wanted to write. When they were ready, Kostogatov began to dictate slowly from the letter, explaining how chaga should be dried, but not dried out, how to grate it, what sort of water to boil in it, how to steep it, strain it, and what quantity to drink. Some of them wrote quickly, some clumsily. They'd ask him to repeat it, and warmth and friendliness spread through the ward. Sometimes they used to answer each other with such antipathy, but what did they have to quarrel over? They all had the same enemy, death. What can divide human beings on earth once they are all faced with death? Dayomka finished writing. In his usual rough, slow voice, older than his years, he said, Yes, but where can we get birch from? There isn't any. They sighed, all of them. Those who had left central Russia long ago, some even voluntarily, as well as the ones who'd never even been there, all now had a vision of that country, unassuming, temperate, unscorched by the sun, seen through a haze of thin sunlit rain, or in the spring floods with the muddy fields and forest roads. A quiet land where the simple forest tree is so useful and necessary to man. The people who live in those parts do not always appreciate their home. They yearn for bright blue seas and banana groves. But no, this is what man really needs, the hideous black growth on the bright birch tree, its sickness, its tumor. Only Mersolomov and Egenberdev thought to themselves that here too, in the plains and on the hills, there was bound to be just what they needed, because man is provided with all he needs in every corner of the earth. He only has to know where to look. We'll have to ask someone to collect it and send it, the geologist said to Dayomka. He seemed attracted by the idea of the Chaga. Gostolgatov himself, the discoverer and expounder of it all, had no one in Russia he could ask to look for the fungus. The people he knew were either already dead or scattered about the country, or he'd have felt awkward about approaching them. Others were complete cityites who'd never been able to find the right birch tree, let alone the chaga on it. He could not imagine any greater joy than to go away into the woods for months on end to break off this chaga, crumble it, boil it up on a campfire, drink it and get well like an animal, to walk through the forest for months to know no other care than to get better, just as a dog goes to search for some mysterious grass that will save him. But the way to Russia was forbidden to him. The other people there, to whom it was open, had not learned the wisdom of making sacrifices, the skill of shaking off in essentials. They saw obstacles where there were none. How could they get sick leave or a holiday to go off on a search? How could they suddenly disrupt their lives and leave their families? Where were they to get money from? What clothes should they wear for such a journey? And what should they take with them? What station should they get off at? And where should they go to find out more about it? 
Vostolgatov tapped his letter and went on. He says here there are people who call themselves suppliers, ordinary, enterprising people who gather the chaga, dry it, and send it to you cash on delivery. But they charge a lot. Fifteen rubles a kilogram, and you need six kilograms a month. What right do they have to do that? said Pavel Nikolaevich indignantly. His face became sternly authoritative, enough to scare any supplier who came before him or even make him mess his pants. What sort of conscience do they have, fleecing people for something that nature provides free? Don't sh Don't shout. All right, that's a typo. Don't shout. Yefrem hissed at him. It's either shout or shooth. I think shout makes more sense. Don't shout, Yefren hissed at him. His way of distorting words was particularly unpleasant. It was impossible to tell whether he had did it on purpose or because his tongue could not cope with them. Do you think you can just go into the woods and get it? You have to walk about in the forest with a sack and an axe. And in the winter you need skis. But not fifteen rubles a kilogram. Black marketeers, damn them! Rusanov simply could not compromise on such a matter. Again, the red patches began to appear on his face. It was wholly a question of principle. Over the years, Rusanov had become more and more unshakably convinced that all our mistakes, shortcomings, imperfections, and inadequacies were the result of speculation. Scallions, radishes, and flowers were sold on the street by dubious types. Milk and eggs were sold by peasant women in the market, and yogurt, woolen socks, even fried fish at the railway stations. There was a large-scale speculation, too. Trucks were being driven off on the side from state warehouses. If these two kinds of speculation could be torn up by the roots, everything in our country could be put right quickly, and our successes would be even more striking. There was nothing wrong with a man strengthening his material position with the help of a good salary from the state and a good pension. Pavel Nikolaevich's dream was to be awarded a special personal pension. Such a man had earned his car, his cottage in the country, and a small house in town to himself. But a car of the same make, from the same factory, or a country cottage of the same standard type acquired a completely different criminal character if they had been bought through speculation. Pavel Nikolaevich dreamed, literally dreamed, of introducing public executions for speculators. Public executions would speedily bring complete health to our society. All right, then, Yefrem was angry, too. Stop shouting. That's again, says T.H., Stop shooting, shouting. No asterisks to be found. I'll have to look it up later. I'm just going to say shouting. All right, then. Yefrem was angry, too. Stop shouting and go through a coop. If 15 rubles is too much for you, don't buy it. Rusonov realized this was his weak spot. He hated speculators. But his tumor would not wait for the new medicine to be approved by the Academy of Medical Science and for the Central Russia cooperatives to organize a constant supply of it. The voiceless newcomer, who with his notebook looked like a reporter from an influential newspaper, almost climbed onto Kostogotov's bed. He spoke insistently and hoarsely. The address of the suppliers is the address of the suppliers in the letter. Pavel Nikolaevich, too, got ready to write down the address. But for some reason, Kostogotov didn't reply. Whether there was an address in the letter or not, he just didn't answer. Instead, he got down from the windowsill and began to rummage under the bed for his boots. In defiance of all hospital rules, he kept them hidden there for taking walks. Dayomka hid the prescription in his bedside table. Without trying to learn more, he began to lay his leg very carefully on the bed. He didn't and couldn't have that sort of money. Yes, the birch tree helped, but it didn't help everyone. Rusanov was really quite embarrassed. He had just had a skirmish with Bone Chewer, 
not for the first time in three days, either, and was now patiently interested in his story and dependent on him for the address. Thinking he ought to butter Bone Shewer up a bit, he started unintentionally and involuntarily, as it were, on something that united them, and said with a good deal of sincerity, Yes, what on earth can one imagine worse than this? This cancer? He hadn't got cancer. Then this oncological, in fact, cancer? But Kostolgatov wasn't in the least touched by this remark of trust coming from someone so much older, senior in rank, and more experienced than he was, wrapping round his leg a rust-colored putty that he had just been drying, and pulling on a disgusting, dilapidated rubber cloth knee boot with coarse patches on the creases, he barked, What's worse than cancer? Leprosy. The loud, heavy, threatening word resounded through the room like a salvo. Or salvo, could be. Pavel Nikolaevich grimaced, peaceably enough. Well, it depends. Is it really worse? Leprosy? Leprosy is a much slower process. Kostolotov started with a dark and unfriendly expression into Pavel Nikolaevich's bright glasses and the bright eyes beyond them. It's worse because they banish you from the world and you are still alive. They tear you from your family and put you behind barbed wire. You think that's any easier to take than a tumor? Pavel Nikolaevich felt quite uneasy. The dark burning glance of this rough, indecent man was so close to him, and he was quite defenseless. Well, what I mean is, all these damned diseases. Any educated man would have seen at this point that it was time to make a conciliatory gesture, but Boneshewer couldn't understand this. He couldn't appreciate Pavel Nikolaevich's tact. He rose to his full, lengthy height and put on a roomy, dirty gray, fustian women's dressing gown that reached down almost to his boots. It served him as an overcoat when he went for walks. Then he announced in his self-satisfied way, thinking how learned he sounded, a certain philosopher once said, if a man never became ill, he would never get to know his own limitations. Taking a rolled up army belt, four fingers wide with a five-pointed star on the buckle from the pocket of the women's dressing gown, He'd wrapped himself in, he put it round himself, only taking care not to tie it too tight in the place where his tumor was. Chewing a wretched, cheap little cigarette end, the sort that goes out before it's all smoked, he walked to the door. The interviewer with the wheezing throat retreated before Kostoglatov along the passageway between the beds. Still looking like some sort of banker or minister, he nevertheless kept begging Kostolgatov to answer him, deferring to him as if it were some bright star of oncological science who was about to leave the building forever. Tell me, roughly, in what percentage of cases does a tumor of the throat turn out to be cancer? It is disgraceful to make fun of illness or grief, but even illness and grief must be borne without lapsing into the ridiculous. Kostoglatov looked at the lost, terrified face of the man who had been flitting around the ward so absurdly. He had probably been rather domineering before he got his tumor. Even the understandable habits of holding the throat with the fingers while speaking seemed somehow funny when he did it. Thirty-four, said Kostoglatov. He smiled at him and stood aside. Hadn't he done too much crackling himself today? Hadn't he perhaps said too much, said something he shouldn't have? But the restless interviewer would not leave him. He hurried down the stairs after him, bending his portly frame forward, still talking, and wheezing over Kostolgatov's shoulder. What do you think, comrade? If any tumor doesn't hurt, is it a good or a bad sign? What does it show? tiresome, defenseless people. What do you do? Kostolgatov stopped and asked him. I'm a lecturer, a big-eared man 
with gray, sleek hair. He looked at Gostogatov, hopefully, as at a doctor. Lecturer in what? What subject? Philosophy, replied the bank manager, remembering his former self and reimagining some of his bearings. Although he had shown a weary face all day, he had forgiven Gostogatov his misplaced and clumsy quotations from the philosophers of the past. He wouldn't reproach him. He needed the supplier's address. A lecturer, and it's your throat. Gostogatov shook his head from side to side. He had no regrets about not giving the supplier's address out loud in the ward. By the standards of the community that for seven years had dragged him along like a slab of metal through a wire drawing machine, only a stupid sucker would do a thing like that. Everyone would rush off and write to these suppliers. The prices would be inflated, and he wouldn't get his chaga. It was his duty, though, to tell a few decent people one by one. He'd already made up his mind to tell the geologist, even though they'd exchanged no more than ten words, because he liked the look of him and the way he'd spoken up in defense of cemeteries. And he'd tell Dayomka except that Dayomka didn't have any money. In fact, Oleg didn't have any either. There was nothing for him to buy the Chaga with. And he would give it to Fedorow, Ni Sibgatov, his friends in distress. There's an asterisk next to distress. The asterisk says, they all belong to the deported nationalities and were exiles from Kostolgatov. All right, so all these other guys that he mentioned basically are all from the Gulag as well, I'm assuming. They would all have to ask him one by one, though, and anyone who didn't ask would be left out. But this philosophy lecturer struck Oleg as a foolish fellow. What did he churn out in his lectures, anyway? Perhaps he was just clouding people's brains. And what was the point of all his philosophy if he was so completely helpless in the face of his illness? But what a coincidence in the throat of all places. Write down the supplier's address, Kostolgatov commanded. But it's only for you. The philosopher, in grateful haste, bent down to write. After he had dictated it, Oleg managed to tear himself away. He hurried to fit in his walk before they locked the outer door. There was no one outside on the porch. Oleg breathed in the cold, damp, still air happily. Then, before it had time to cleanse him, he lit up a cigarette. Whatever happened, his happiness could never be complete without a cigarette. Though Donsova was not the only one now to have warned him to stop smoking, Maslenikov, too, had found room to mention it in his letter. There was, there was no wind or frost. Reflected in a window pane, he could see a nearby puddle. There was no ice on its black water. It was only the 5th of February, and already it was spring. He wasn't used to it. The fog wasn't fog, more a light prickly mist that hung in the air, so light that it did not cloud, but merely softened and blurred the distant lights of street lamps and windows. On Oleg's left, four pyramidal poplars toured high above the roof like four brothers. On the other side, a poplar stood on its own, but bushy and the same height as the other four. Behind it, there was a thick group of trees and a wedge of parkland. From the unfenced stone porch of Wing 13, a few steps led down to a sloping asphalt pathway, lined on both sides by an impenetrable hedge. It was leafless for the moment, but its thickness announced that it was alive. Oleg had come out for a stroll along the pathway in the park, his leg with each step and stretch rejoicing at being able to walk firmly, at being the living leg of a man who had not died. But the view from the porch held him back, and he finished his cigarette there. There was a soft light from the occasional lamps and windows of the wings opposite. By now, there was hardly anyone walking along the paths. And when there was no rumble from the railway, closed by at the back, you could just hear the faint, even sound, of the river 
a fast foaming mountain stream which rushed down behind the nearby wings under the side of the hill. Further on, beyond the hill and across the river, there was another park, the municipal one, and perhaps it was from there, except that it was cold, or from the open windows of a club, he could hear dance music being played by a brass band. It was Saturday, and they were dancing. Couples were dancing together. Oleg was excited by all his talking and the way they'd listened to him. He was seized and enveloped by a feeling that life had suddenly returned, the life with which, just two weeks ago, he had closed all accounts. Though this life promised him nothing that the people of this great town called good and struggled to acquire, neither apartment, property, social success, nor money, there were other joys, sufficient in themselves, which he had not forgotten how to value. The right to move about without waiting for an order. The right to be alone. The right to gaze at stars that were not blinded by prison camp searchlights. The right to put the light out at night and sleep in the dark. The right to put letters in a letter box. The right to rest on Sunday the right to bathe in the river. Yes, there were many, many more rights like these, and among them was the right to talk to women. His recovery was giving him back all these countless wonderful rights. The music from the park just reached him. Oleg heard it, not the actual tune they were playing, but as if it were Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, its restless, strained beginning ringing inside him, one incomparable melody. It was the melody, Oleg interpreted it in his own way, although perhaps it ought to be understood differently, in which the hero is returned to life or perhaps regaining his vision after being blind. He gropes with his fingers, as it were, slides his hand over things or over a face that is dear to him, touching them still afraid to believe his good fortune, that these things really exist, that his eyes are beginning to see. And that concludes chapter 11. And holy fuck, that was a long chapter. Let me take a quick look back at how many pages that was, because it was definitely a lot of them. Let's see, 10. All right, maybe I'm just really a slow reader. So 135 to 155, 30, 40, fuck, I suck. That's only 20 pages. I don't know why that took so long. Sorry, everyone, but that was fun. Anyway, that's chapter 11 of Cancer Ward by Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn. Anyway, thanks, guys, for tuning in. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. Um, see you tomorrow.